Hey, Dr. Scott. Hello. How are you doing, Aaron? I'm good. And you? Good. Enjoy browsing through your book. Well done. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you're here. Um, but to just formally like introduce you to, to whoever will be watching this, <laughs> um, you're obviously Dr. Scott Isaacson. Um, and you've been researching and teaching about creativity since the early 1970s, I guess. Uh, you're the founder of the Creative Problem Solving Group, which you put up in 1982. And I know you teach until now, right? Leadership uh, and organization behavior at the BI Norwegian Business School. Right. And Case Weatherhead Reserve at Ohio. I remember when I was taking my MBA here, um, we would get a smattering of cases from Case Weatherhead Reserve. Yeah. Uh, and you were the director of the International Center for Studies and Creativity. And uh, I think you're still a consulting editor for uh, the Journal of Creative Behavior. I just got oh, yes. the newest, oh, yeah. uh, the, most recent, that, <laughs> the most recent uh, issue. And um, of course, you are um, one of the most distinguished leaders, or you've been awarded the Distinguished Leader Award by the Creative Education Foundation back in 1995. You've published over 200 books, articles, and, and what have you related to creativity, and you have um, trained um, over 400, 450 organizations in 26 countries all over the world. So right. again, I, I, you, I welcome you to, to this um, episode. So I, I want to get right into it. Um, I want to know how you define creativity yourself. Yeah, first, you know that there are so many different definitions of creativity. And so rather than lacking definition, I think we have an abundance uh, of definitions. I like using the one, the one that's in my head is that it, for me, creativity is about making and communicating meaningful new connections. There's a lot packed in that definition. Sure, um, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's newness, meaningfulness, value, um, and there are multiple levels uh, of that all the way up to the genius level. We can use that same lens. How did they develop and communicate these meaningful new things? But also from an everyday perspective, how do, how do children who are learning, um, how do adults and organizations uh, do the same within their context? So I like that, making and communicating meaningful new directions, meaningful new connections to the world. But one of the things that I picked up right there that I wanna, I wanna probe would be that word meaningful. On the one hand, it's quite subjective because you're talking about very different contexts. But on the other hand, there are certain things that we know about meaningfulness that seem to be generic, that, that in order for things to be meaningful, it, it fills, fulfills a need, for example, would be one example of sure. meaningful. Right? It closes a gap. It increases the quality of life for people at the end of the day. That's a very broad sense of meaningfulness, but that's, that's the true. kind of thing I mean by meaningful. Okay, okay, I like that. Uh, you, you've been doing this for quite some time. How, how has um, the study, the practice of creativity evolved? What are the, the, the salient differences from the time you started in the 70s um, and, and now. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess it, it's good to be able to live long and, and, um, and have a lot of experiences along the way. Um, you have this 50 year snapshot of, of something that I'm so passionate about. Uh, so I really want to see, you know, I want to know it. I want to get it from you. What, what's the difference, right? Aaron, I can just tell you this. When I first started in 1970, I was in this experimental program that the Creative Education Foundation and the college and a number of organizations sponsored. The big question back then was, can we deliberately develop creativity? Um, there were lots of things going on in the field. You know, Alex Osborne kind of started things out here in Buffalo. I was from New York City area. I came to Buffalo to study. And by complete chance, I was invited to play in this experiment, a two-year experiment. And um, I was lucky enough to be put into the experimental group. So I got all the training from Sid Parnes and Ruth Nuller and all those guys. Nice. Um, and it, it, but the Osborne program, wasn't there it, anymore. 
way this No, year. Alex unfortunately had passed away in 1967. So he was, okay. he was gone, but Sid had worked directly with him. Um, I was able, as part of my student work, um, I was able to uh, enter a room and organize files that um, were Alex Osborne's correspondence files. He was oh. prolific. But I had a chance to organize a lot of this correspondence. So I felt very close to him sure. in terms of seeing his passion for uh, the development of creativity. So it was his vision. And he was aimed at American education. He was trying to make some change. And that's why he founded the foundation. And the foundation was linked because it was an educational uh, emphasis to bring a more creative trend to American education. It was natural to be associated with the university at the time. So there we were, we had this two year series of courses. And when I was taking other courses at the same university, um, a lot of the professors there called us a cult, a cult on campus. And, and I guess in, the, in terms of the field, there had been some marvelous things done. I mean, back to Guilford in 1950 and so on. It was a very promising field, but it was really off to the side. It was not mainstream. Sure. The idea that you could teach creativity um, was ridiculous to some people. It's like you are or you aren't. And a lot of people, um, I guess that's why they had this question and why they invested in two year experimental study to see, can we make a difference? You know, can we deliberately develop? And so I think it's safe to say that Osborne along with Parnes and Nuller uh, broke a paradigm. The paradigm was you are either, you're gifted, creative or you're not. And we know you're creative if you are a well-known artist, a musician, a scientist or whatever, very high level, genius level. And I think what he did essentially was he democratized creativity. Uh, he made it something that he, from his experience in advertising um, and from his writing and study and the, the center and the, the program and the experiment broke that paradigm and said, no, look, there's very clear scientific evidence here experimentally controlled study that shows we can we can develop we can, this thing we call creativity is something that may belong to a lot more people than just those geniuses i, mean, I love the gene i love my art love my science of course um, but it's something that all of us can kind of connect to and and so over the years what's happened i think is more of an acceptance um and now it's not just an acceptance what's beautiful to see what i'm very happy about is that now uh, when you say the word creativity, a lot of people acknowledge, yeah, this is very important as a human characteristic that we need to develop it. So I think that a lot of progress has been made in that regard. So now it's, it's, it's quite acceptable um, from cult to community, I think is one of the, one of the happy things I've seen. That's a I've nice point there, from, from a the cult years. to a community. <laughs> For those who are not familiar, Alex Osborne is one of the founders of BBDO, one of the uh, greatest ad agencies then and now. And I'm trying to, to put myself in his shoes. At that time, you're already set. You are retired. You've had a great career already, right? <laughs> you're responsible for, for one of the greatest ad agencies. But then he totally devotes his life to this other thing, to, to the as you pointed out earlier, to really democratizing creativity, to creating the oldest um, foundation there is related to creativity, to spearheading all of these things. And I just wanted to, to point that out, that he didn't need to do it, right? Um, oh, no. He, he, oh, no. he could have just retired and enjoyed his life, but it was really, I guess, a passion and, and, and a mission to, to democratize creativity. I think I love your word passion, Aaron, because I, I think that's critical. I mean, remember Alex wrote, he was writing and, and doing all sorts. He has a great career here in Buffalo. And eventually, you know, he used to take the train rides every week from Buffalo to New York. Now that's, that, that's 440 miles. And he would fill the time using his imagination. He'd write poetry, he'd do art, read, study. Um, but I think Prior to Applied Imagination, he had written other books. Back the year I was born, he wrote, you know, um, How to Think Up and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. He started writing. And, and he was also stimulated by other people. The founder of Reader's Digest, had, and he had a conversation. And it was about passion. 
And, and that's where Alex used the term, I, I'm, I'm passionate to trying to understand this thing of, about the human imagination. But his whole experience in advertising, you know, he would, he would talk, I, I've listened to some of his tapes, and um, he would talk about in advertising, having a, a group of people, very smart people, who were what we call the creatives, you sure. know, the graphic artists and da, da, da. Yeah. And then he had the suits, you know, the yeah. business people. The and you know the deal. And it's that internal tension of needing both in the organization. And that's partly what caused him to go searching for methods and procedure. How does it, how do we get these very smart, bright, motivated people who are so different? How do we get them to creatively collaborate? Um, of course, one of Ruth Noller's uh, lasting legacies is her creativity formula, right? And if you look at the elements of the formula, knowledge, imagination, evaluation, uh, those three, and then obviously the person's atti attitude, those four are, 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 are things that are important, but borderline cliche. I mean, uh, if, if you, if you look, look, at, look at those four at face value, right? Most management courses and books would talk about that. So um, if, if, if you look at today, right, the, 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 the tradition that was started by Ruth Noller, and, but if you look at today, what kind of knowledge, uh, imagination, and evaluation are important now? What do those things mean in this context? If we go back to, to your earlier point about meaningfulness and, and, and context. Well, one of the things when she shared this with me in 1970, um, remember she's a mathematician by background. She worked on the very first. That's computer, the formula. <laughs> the, the Mark I computer at Harvard. You know, she worked on that with Grace Topper. So she was thinking that way. And, and she was trying to help people understand some of the dynamics associated with creativity. And I liked it because I was going to teach younger kids. So creativity is a function of an attitude, which I think is really uh, can, cannot be overstated. That's of true. knowledge, imagination, and evaluation. And young kids have a lot of imagination. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they may not have as much domain relevant knowledge. They're learning a lot. And they may not have the critical aspects of criteria and knowing what fits and what's meaningful. But then over time, you know, the imagination value seems to go down and then the others, you know, go up. Um, and so she helped me understand the dynamics of creativity mm -hmm. that way. Um, and it's at multiple levels. It's uh, at the individual level, but teams have the same dynamic that play. The important thing in mathematics is in, from a function formula standpoint, right? If any value goes to zero, mm -hmm. it all falls yes. apart. So yes. what, I think that one of the big takeaways is that we have to learn to keep multiple balls in the air at once. And our natural response is to focus on one. Um, but I think the idea is, uh, the really the, the idea that's relevant today from this is that we need to consider creativity from an open, dynamic, complex, adaptive system perspective. That it's not, it's not fixed uh, and that it's not like, it's not really an algorithm at all. I mean, there may be some aspects you can create algorithms for, um, but it's a very open, complex and dynamic system. The other, the other way to look at the formula she and I worked for so long to try to help other people understand this thing that we were learning about, this creativity world. We were asked to go out and work with school districts and teachers and managers and so on. So we had this long, it, was, it took about a year, but that's where we started looking at the interaction of people with mm -hmm. process, producing outcomes and products, all happening in a place. And so the famous Venn is something that Ruth and I worked on for over a year to try to help others understand there wasn't a single definition of creativity, but That's you could look true. at it from how do we think about people in the creative world? How do we think about a creative process? What is a creative outcome? And this is in your book. And then yes. also all of this seems to happen in a place, an environment, a culture, true. a context, true. a climate. And so if we're gonna really try to understand this big thing called human creativity, that we have to see it as a dynamic, the formula, creativity is a function of knowledge, imagination, and evaluation. And we have to put it in this context of people, process, product, and place. 
So it's a really big mother of a concept. How does the pandemic mess things up? <laughs> or or how, what, what did you learn about creativity during the pandemic? The pandemic has, has done a lot to mess a lot of people up. But I think back to the attitude part in, in, in Ruth's formula, you know, it's that little A she put on the function symbol. And yeah. uh, I think the pandemic- Not has so little, important. not so little after all, right? <laughs> no, in fact, it's right outside. It's, it's, a, it's a part of the function of the interaction yes. of the dynamics. And so um, it, for me, it's, it's, it's been amplified. Uh, when yeah. I work, uh, personally, when I work on my own, but also I'm still trying to keep up with client work, um, and advising graduate students doing research and so on. So it's all this way. It's all digital. Zoom. Um, yeah. The importance of that attitude. And, and I'm reminded of work that's being done academically on the power of positive thinking. It, it was something that you know, was talked about back in the 60s. Um, but, but there are scholars now that are finding the link. And now, unlike when we had Ned doing his thing early on about whole brain thinking and so on and so forth, um, I think we've, we've been able to put even more science to it since Ned did his work. And this notion, I'll, I'll just give you one example of one academic who's doing some phenomenal work. Her name is uh, Barbara Fre Fredrickson. She talks about the spiral. And, and she's working with colleagues in the medical field, in the bio -neuro neurological field to look at brain function, actually looking at PET, MRI, active MRI, and so on. And what she's seeing is, that when you have um, anxiety, which the pandemic certainly has created its fair share of, um, of and fear, uh, anger, uh, depression, um, all the things we see going on, that spiral tends to go downward. Mm -hmm. um, that's her metaphor is the spiral. And when it goes down, there's obviously impact on brain function, problem solving, decision-making, creativity, um, and it tends to slow things down. It, it, it actually has an, a harmful effect on what we've talked about as creativity. But as you can start to put an attitude of um, belief in self and, and that we can get through this and that we, we have, there are opportunities here and um, you start to put a more positive set of, of things in hope, faith, the power of positive thinking, if you will, it moves you up the spiral, it loosens the functionality up. It actually has a much more positive effect on all of all the tools and techniques we have and, and, and the approaches we take for creative problem solving. It actually enhances the, the use of all of that. So nowadays with the pandemic, it's not enough just to have a conversation about creativity. Um, it's dealing with this attitude and, and taking people where they are, right, Aaron? You gotta, that's where life is about that, right? It's to take people as they are but trying to help move the spiral up to a more positive attitude, to being able to be personally connected in a positive, fulfilling way. So I, that's a lot of my work with clients. I, mean, when I do this thing for GE with a colleague from the UK. It's a global customer summit. They bring 400 people in from 12 countries uh, into Crotonville, New York. And it's, it's, I would characterize a lot of it, uh, trying to be kind, um, death by PowerPoint. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot of push information. It's a tiered lecture hall. Uh, sure. People are relatively passive. Uh, they do get to do, ask a few questions. So out of 400 people, you may get three or four people. They get a chance to ask a question. And so on. And I look at this and go, okay, this is okay. Sharing information is okay. It's a legitimate thing, but that's not for me. That, I, you know, that, so Paul and I, the first thing we do in this large lecture hall is we say, Okay, we'd like you to find a connect with a partner and find someone you haven't met yet and stand up and move around. And we want you to have a conversation about something that very positive and fulfilling that happened to you in the last 48 hours. Nice. And literally we just get them three minutes to go find a partner and stand up. It becomes very chaotic and noisy. Yeah, um, 400 people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they move around, they find someone they wanna have a conversation with and they exchange um, these events that help them uh, to become more positive. And we, we don't waste a lot. We just say three minutes, go. And, and then we have to bring them back and then, and then ask them, we, we get some examples. And what we notice 
is that the whole attitude in the room, the climate in the room has changed. Nice. The, 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 now, instead of three or four people asking questions, everybody's asking questions and we, get, we have some group work going on and then we get them doing a few things in our time together. And one, it's a lot more fulfilling for us because we get to learn some stuff too. And the engagement is so high. And so this whole thing, I mean, it, it, it's, it happens when we do a one-on-one, -on -one, almost like this, uh, you know, what are we grateful for? What are we happy about? Um, starting meetings that way, is, it's very, uh, it, as long as you provide the time for it, you know, it changes the attitude, it changes the climate of the way you work. And this, this happens at an individual level, it can happen at a team level, it can happen at an organizational level. So I think that's an under-recognized little A that Ruth put in the, uh, the function formula. <laughs> it needs to be amplified, particularly during a pandemic. Over the last 50 years, if there's one, and, and you know, like us facilitators and mentors and teachers, we can point to, to favorites or um, really memorable projects, clients, or what have you. Particularly um, those that really taught us about our field. What would be one of those for you? I have a hard time coming up with just one, Aaron. Um, there are a couple. Which is better. Right. I'll give you a couple. I, I, um, even better. I think one of the first really big projects I took on was with Procter & Gamble. And it was the first time I would ventured out. But my first 25 years was mostly academic, educational. And in that time frame, I was invited to help them um, with something called Project Discovery. And it was partly that we had inherited this tradition of Osborne Parnes. I was playing with integrating it within the classroom and in our own instructional program at Buffalo State. But it was the first real major uh, program. It went on for multiple years, but the heavy part of it was ramping up their new product development concepts. And we had access to 90 people inside Proctor we had five different projects going on to help them. They had constrained themselves internally with concept development. They had very few concepts that were in their QFD list. And the idea was ramping this whole thing up. It was like a perfect, uh, a perfect project to see what works. Sure. You know, so I had a team at the center and a few other people from outside. Then I hired in some people. I was the lead consultant to put this whole thing together. And then they agreed to let us study the impact. So after we got that, we moved from, I think it was 28 concepts is, is what they had on their QFD list. And in a few months, I think it was four, maybe six months, we moved it from that to 78 concepts on their QFD list. And we had lots of, we were doing all sorts of different things, traditional creativity generation, but we had ethnography going on. We had a, tech, a futurist, you know, we, we put a whole bunch of people together to work in teams, to do all this work. And it opened my eyes to this question about really what works, because we got a chance to evaluate. We knew where all the breakthrough concepts came from. We were able to track it back to the method that was being deployed and, and what, what happened. We took very good records and we studied it all. And so that project really taught me um, the lessons uh, that this thing we call creativity and creative problem solving, it is very powerful and it is something that can be managed um, and facilitated uh, deliberately. It led to a blockbuster product. Um, and and nice. it's those sorts of things that said, ah, there is real commercial value here. Mm -hmm. The next project that for me made, made me feel good, um, doing well uh, and, and doing good at the other um, end of it all is um, we were asked, I had, some, I had some work in South Africa and we were there um, uh, basically uh, after Mandela had been elected president, I had a chance to meet the finance minister and um, at a program, it was a, a, just a, a wonderful time of transformation. And at, at one point down the line, we were asked to help um, make a, a, a transition because at the time when everything was changing, there were very few institutions that were in place. And the one institution that needed the most work was the police force, because it was well organized. Uh, and the, yeah, the idea was, let's transform this police force to a police service. Wow. Big project. 
And one of the things, I mean, there were many, many parts of this project. We helped a little bit to design the larger project, but what we took on was the idea of developing um, facilitators, that the service was about facilitation. And how can we convey all our learnings that we had about facilitating group problem solving, community problem solving? How do we become attentive to needs in the community? How do we process that? How do we get engagement from that community? How do we bring people that were very different together and create a space that was there? And they helped us. I mean, they, they gave us the cultural lens. I mean, you have 11 different languages there. Um, and so they had to help us do this. But to, to help make the police force into a police service and all the elements of CPS and other, other things that played a role there, facilitation, facilitative leadership, um, that, that is one of the projects that stands out to me as one I'm most happy about. I can only imagine how fulfilling that was. There you were, um, a, a creativity uh, practitioner suddenly your craft is being used for something so noble, and uh, um, you know that that you know the minute you said from police force to police service, what what one word can do to a concept, right? Uh, and they had a lot of law and us order different and words. With the eleven different languages, they were able to teach us a lot more about the way that language uh, was translating into their cultures mm -hmm. and how how sensitive we needed to be. And that's why for me, context is so important. You know, um, the, the communities were very different. You had, um, as you know, it was, you didn't have a very wealthy middle-class. You had very big tension um, in, in society and you had to have a, a service that um, really served both. And boy, the learning we had about their culture, the rich culture, cultures uh, that existed yeah, in yeah. South Africa at the time and be able to see that movement um, and to go back, you know, a few years later and see how it all is continuing. It's an, it's an ongoing struggle, um, but to see the value that was there. It, it, you, I love the word noble. It, it felt noble to do. I wanted to ask because, you know, creative problem solving has several steps. Um, but if you were to, to distill for you your, your greatest hits or your... Um, um, your go-to tools um, in, in understanding the challenge, for instance, in finding these reframes, in reframing the, the problems, what, what would be your favorites? Yeah, I pondered this question when you sent it along because I, I found it interesting to reflect. And remember I told you the story of going out with Sid Parnes and how yes. like a cat, he always landed on his feet and always uh, the, the people he was working with always felt as though they had created something that was meaningful and new. But when I compared that to what we were learning in the program and the courses that, yeah, yeah, I could see that there, but there was an awful lot more that Sid was doing. And so that led to some major changes in you know, studying what, what worked like with Procter and Gamble and other practical experiences we realized that um, the Osborne Parnas tradition that was very linear and very prescribed had to be broken up. Um, that by itself was a big, it didn't, didn't make me very popular at the time, but we broke up the process. And so we had these components like clarity, understanding the challenge, idea generation. Uh, idea generation is the more traditional creative uh, bit, but yes. getting clarity is such, it's such an important, getting people on the same page about what the opportunities are, such an important part. And then once you get these meaningful new insights, how do you actually move them forward? So planning for action. So I think all three components have to coexist. But the, for me, the most important insight and development was once we broke the process apart, Aaron, you could no longer start at the top and drop a marble and go through fact finding, problem finding, idea finding yeah. and all that. You have to kind of see these as as co-equal, co-potentially valuable components. Mm -hmm. The tools and techniques are the same. I mean, uh, you, you still use brainstorming, visual identifying relationships, highlighting has the tools are the tools, but it, the, the thing is, it's what's the purpose behind the tool? And if you know it's about clarity, the language changes, the attitude changes. If you know it's about ideas, we know how to do these things as facilitators. We, you know, we have books, your book, we have other materials that help us do all those things. For me, the most important insight 
is what I would call the, once you broke the process up, you had to have a way of navigating. And that opened up a whole new sphere of inquiry, work, and development. In other words, um, at any point in time, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like Microsoft Office. You know, we have, um, we have oh, sure. PowerPoint for presentations, we have Word for writing reports, and we have Excel for crunching numbers, right? And when you open your operating system, you have the access to any one of those things sure. and others, right? So to me, the components hang out there just much like, like Microsoft Office. But what's interesting is we forget sometimes it's very implicit. And that's what I saw Sid do. Sid had an operating system and he was able to navigate his way in and out of these components and stages. So we call it, you know, in, in a sense, it's uh, we call it appraising a task. Is this task appropriate for CPS? Not everything is. Um, you know, if it's novel, complex, and ambiguous, yeah, yeah, good. Is there clientship? Is there ownership uh, for this task? Because it takes energy. You know, it, it's it's work. It's hard work true. Uh, true. To, to apply creative problem solving effectively. So the whole notion of, of doing some appraisal and massaging the, the task itself. And then based on those insights, designing your pathway through. So once I know what the need is, um, you know, we find that, you know, for example, although our field has a lot of techniques and tools for idea generation, right? We have hundreds of them. Sure. Yes. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I am finding that there is no shortage of ideas. Um, part of the challenge appears to be, are we clear about what the opportunity is? or what the challenge is. So applying those same tools. Um, so I think this whole idea of navigating your way through the process and not being limited by a prescribed preset series of stages, That's but true. keeping it open That's true. And, and back to context, fitting, fitting the context, fitting the task, and then using that in information to design your way through. The tools and techniques are cognition. I mean, it's just, yes. They, yes. they've been around for a long time, mostly generating. I think the other bit that's been most important to CPS is the, is the importance of converging and focusing. And that we've always yeah. had those guidelines. Osborne's guidelines are well known. Everyone kind of knows what brainstorming is. Well, they think. Sure. Um, but having yeah. a parallel set of, of guidelines that guide focusing in a productive way. And then using that, so you have this idea of navigating your way through, you're creatively designing a process that's living and dynamic and open. And then using the tools in service of that need and the people, um, connecting it to clientship. Do we have ownership? So the, it's important to make sure novelty stay, stays alive, but to do it in a way that makes sense, it's meaningful, suggests synthesis. And it ultimately, maybe it's expanding your box or moving it, maybe it becomes not a box, but a, a package of different sorts. But the idea at some point, it has to make sense. It has to have meaning. Mm -hmm. So how do you really um, help people become creative? The, the most, I think the most important thing for me personally, Aaron, has been one of the ways we started looking at people is we've been looking at um, style differences. Um, mm -hmm. We used to use the KAI, the adapter innovator distinction. We, we use the MBTI quite a bit. Ultimately, we decided to develop our own assessment device. We call it VIEW. Mm -hmm. And it has um, an orientation to change, which we use the words explorer for someone who okay. asks why and goes into fundamentally new space. And then we use the word developer for someone who asks how and works within constraints to add value and improve. And for us, this idea about to being a little bit more democratic about creativity is that we, our belief is that everyone has creative potential. And instead of asking the question that most of the creative world and the research site has been asking, which is how creative are you? Are you a rock or are you a genius? Um, that's a level question. Um, yeah. What I find most fascinating and most helpful is the style question. How are you creative? So it's, it's a different starting place. And, and once you start to, and it's, it, it speaks to the attitude thing um, about building confidence. Um, but the idea is, that essentially um, there is no inherent value to one style over the other. And that's a hard thing to wrap your head around. 
that there's equal potential value. It, of course, it depends on the context and depends on the task mm -hmm. and the people you're working with. But essentially, explorers are not more creative than developers and developers are not more creative than explorers. So creating a more inclusive mindset for me has been one of the most important things. And I, yeah, I have to yeah, say yeah. that in terms of the most important insight I've, I've taken away in 50 and, and the joy that I get when I work with people uh, in groups is when, see, I think there's a natural bias out there in our field that favors the innovator. It favors the explorer. Out of the box seems to be what's important here, you know? And um, when a developer comes up after doing a workshop like the strategy workshop where we did all this generating and focusing and ended up in a very good place to help them go forward. When a developer comes up to me during a break and says, you know, Scott, didn't know this before this workshop, but you know, I said, I, have, I am creative. I am creative. And uh, that, you know, that the acceptance that I am creative, I, I have capability to add value for meaningful new connections. And uh, I may not be the kind of person that questions the paradigm and goes on my creative loner journey way out in Never Neverland, but you know, I can take those things and I can really collaborate and I can help make things happen in this organization. So it really helped me connect to my creativity. You know what, Aaron? I mean, I didn't even have to get paid for that event. I, that, that joy that came from that conversation I want to thank you for, for, for accommodating me and sharing all those wonderful stories. Um, and, and again, I, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Scott. For, I've enjoyed, for I've enjoyed meeting you, Aaron, and I've enjoyed the questions and the conversation, and I've learned some things from you too.